Welcome to this Baptist News Global webinar. Here's your host, Mark Wingfield. Hey everyone, uh, welcome uh, to our latest uh, Baptist News Global webinar, and we're thrilled to have with us today John Pavlovitz. Uh, and if you haven't seen it yet, uh, John's latest book looks like this, uh, If God is Love, Don't Be a Jerk. Uh, and so uh, I'm sure these are flying off the shelves like hotcakes. Uh, they ought to be. It's a great book, well written, and um, I, I just highly encourage you to uh, take a look at it if you haven't. So we're going to be talking today about that book, but about a lot more because uh, I want our readers and those uh, who don't know John to know more about him. Um, I, I, I want to tell a brief story first about the, when I first met John, and I don't know if you remember this, John, but in 2016, after I wrote the article about um, affirming transgender persons as a Christian pastor, uh, John called me out of the blue and said, you don't know what's about to hit you. <laughs> <laughs> but let me tell you. <laughs> That's right. And it was helpful right. advice. And I've appreciated that uh, all, all along the way uh, because John's own story is uh, of, of sudden um, internet celebrity, uh, I guess, right? Um, yeah, yeah being, it was just the idea of that notoriety that comes so quickly that you weren't seeking. And then what do you do when that happens? Yeah. So, uh, John, it, just for just briefly, for those who may not know the backstory, and I know you've told this a jillion times, but bring us up to speed on how you started doing <laughs> the bad things that happened to cause good to come uh, out of what you're doing now. Well, the, the short story of it is that I was raised a Roman Catholic, and that deep that faith was deep and profound for much of my life, but began to drift from that faith as I entered into my college years and really went fully away from organized religion, but was pulled back uh, to the church when my wife, my fiance at the time, and I were looking to get married. And we uh, found this little Methodist chapel um, where we really rediscovered our love for the church and started working as a part-time youth pastor there or youth worker, and then uh, was offered part-time paid position and then a full-time position and really got to the point where I was putting so much passion into this work that I left my secular career as an art director, entered seminary, ended up really in the Methodist church for 17 years or so. And the churches got larger, higher profile. And, um, you know, when I got to a point where I had kind of stretched the community where I was enough, uh, as far as I could, I had gone to a new church where I didn't have the equity of trust that I had, didn't have the relational capital that I had in that church and um, really was uh, terminated within about six months and found myself just not sure what, what I was going to be doing. And the blog, I'd been writing the blog, the blog went viral a couple of weeks later. And then this all happened, really, which, which is now seven years of um, seven sort of years. virtual congregation of sorts. I think it's been seven, it at least it feels like it. maybe it's closer to six, but wow. it's been a while that, that I've been in this really different kind of um, ministerial position and just um, trying to figure out what that looked like and what, what, how I could best use this platform. Well, and it bears noting that uh, your entry into this field of uh, sort of pastor at large uh, happened about the same time as the rise of Donald Trump. Uh, I mean, they didn't have, it wasn't an exact match, but it was very, very close, right? And I think that whole thing propelled the interest in your writing into the stratosphere. Yes, what, what had happened, I had been writing the blog for a while. The blog started while I was still a mega church pastor, and it was really for um, parents of teenagers and for local youth pastors who were sort of looking at our church as a model. And so it was a really kind of small insular community. And then I remember during the Sandy Hook shooting, that day was a real a day that I wrote something really visceral where I wasn't thinking about my job at the time. I wasn't trying to weigh the pastoral expectations. And that allowed me to that that work reached a whole new audience. And I realized that there was a responsibility that I had to speak with specificity 
into what was happening in the world. And that created a tension between my local church ministry position. But as I moved into that space and then the Trump administration, well, the Trump campaign started, I realized this was exactly the kind of thing that I couldn't sidestep and had to speak clearly into. And that placed me in that in that space. Well, I mean, I, I resonate with that having been a journalist and then being a pastor who was also still trying to write uh, and knowing the limitations of what a congregation, even a progressive congregation, uh, will allow from a, a staff member and the, the tensions uh, yes. that, that that creates. I, I absolutely understand what you're saying about that. Uh, I, I think one of the interesting things about the ministry you have now is that I, I don't... I would call you a modern day prophet in some ways. I mean, that may be too too big, but, uh, and, and we know that, you know, historically within the Bible, prophets don't fare well. They, you know, they, uh, <laughs> people don't like prophets. Um, so how how is the work of being a prophet, a modern day prophet in this conflicted world we live in? Uh, is it rough or is it easy? Uh, how, how do you live with that now? Well, part of the, this happened to me rather slowly, even though it seemed in the public eye that it happened quickly because the audience for the blog had started to grow and I experienced a lot of the turbulence that that brings. And for me, the idea of a prophet was simply, you know, in my space, I was simply responding to what I was seeing. So mm -hmm. I was getting better stories about LGBTQ people or Muslims or, or any, or, you know, these communities that are, are tension points for the church. And then once I got those better stories, it was just natural that as a pastor, I spoke into those things. And so it's a difficult job at times, and mostly because you're speaking words to people that are changing the story that they have lived in. Mm -hmm. You're bringing an oppositional opinion to something that they have not had opposition to. And so I understand a lot of the, you know, the, um, the, the defensive posture that happens. And so I try to have a little mercy for the people that I'm often speaking to because I understand what they believe and why they believe it and how deeply they believe it. And I'm telling them a story that's arguing with God. And it's really a difficult task to win an argument with God, right? Yeah. So, you know, one of the dangers we all face in these days of um, isolation and, and division and silos is that we, we can get caught just talking to ourselves over and over again. Yeah. Uh, and I, I know I see a lot of people share your blog uh, online you know, rah, rah, th this is, uh, this is what I believe. Uh, I mean, all the time people are saying, he said this better than I ever could have. This is exactly what I believe. Um, do you feel like you're breaking out of the bubble of people who already are convinced about what you believe? Well, that's been the beauty of the social media thing. When I, when I wrote the blog post that went viral initially, you know, that's 800 words or whatever it was. And I didn't have a church at the time. I didn't have a, a multi-social media, you know, mega empire. I didn't have any money. It was just those words. And those words did the work that they were going to do. And that's the beauty of it in that I, I just um, speak as authentically as I can and trust that those words are going to do what they're going to do and then allow those conversations to happen. You know, I'm a firm believer in, I don't, want to tell someone what to believe, but I want to ask them a question that causes them to examine their assumptions, and then they can do whatever they want to do with that. So it, it, in, in the latest book, and again, for those who joined us late, this is the book that we're talking about here. Uh, you give a hysterical illustration about trying to fit into some pants from your, um, yeah. from your hair band days uh, right. of, of long ago. And you, you basically ended up with a medical emergency because uh, you, you couldn't fit uh, in them. It, it's quite, it's like Carol Burnett kind of stuff. You know, it's very, very funny. Uh, physical comedy, I think. Yes. But your point is that a lot of us are trying to squeeze into a religious belief system that doesn't fit us anymore. And uh, this is a really common theme. I think it, it, it seems like you're connecting with a lot of folks who just are adrift and you identify in the book that sometimes we call these nuns or we call these people who've left religion or we call them people who are deconstructing or whatever. There's all sorts of labels, but you seem to sort of find some common themes with that in your own experience. 
what I, what I try to do is look at the the bedrock and the bedrock of, of humanity of our experience seems to be for me grief and fear. And if I look at what drives those things and then the compassion that comes out of those things, that's what I try to speak into. And, and so I look at this really disparate group of people who are finding the writing. And to your question about, you know, am I still reaching the people or am I breaking out of the bubble? That's the thing. We're all living in really um, diverse community. And so we have this, um, this circle of influence that we interact uh, with. And so I just try to start conversations. One of the greatest things or the most common things I hear is people say, I've been thinking this, but I didn't know that I could say it or you gave me permission to ask it. And, and many times those are people in ministry. And that's all I want. You know, I really just want people to say, let's have the, the church should be the place we can have the most authentic conversations that we ever have. And that we shouldn't be partially edited versions of ourselves. Wow, that's, you know, that's a really great point. And um, you, you, you tap into something that, in my experience, um, many pastors are caught today because their own beliefs are changing and growing. Uh, they realize they don't fit the pants anymore, yeah. but their churches still want them to fit the pants. That's right. And I'm, I'm just assuming that you're probably hearing from a lot of pastors who are struggling uh, with the, the 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 dissonance between where they are and where their churches are? Absolutely, but you know the the other part about it, Mark, is that you when when the the audience that I found has been so large, I always tell people it's not about my writing or my the way I use my words. It's validation that there's a huge group of people who are asking the same questions and feeling the same prompts. And so it is ministers, and we and the ministers do think the churches want that. But yet there are so many people sitting in those pews or in those chairs who are saying, I really want to talk about this, but I don't feel like that I can safely do it. So everyone's afraid of being expelled or pushed to the periphery. And what my writing showed me was there were enough people in those churches, ministers and pew sitters who would have done better just to say, let's actually just say it all. Let's say everything. Let's ask it all because God is not going to be intimidated by that. Only we are going to be intimidated by that vacillation or that doubt or that confrontation. Excuse me. <clears throat> yeah. Wow. Uh, so, uh, so very, very true. And I, I think we see this playing out amplified, of course, by COVID and amplified by all of the racial reconciliation stuff and uh, all of these things that we've already talked about. But you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about lately is, as a, as a journalist, we are breathlessly covering every movement of the evangelical segment of American Christianity as if they are the end all. They just happen to swing elections uh, is, the, is the main thing, but they do not represent the majority of Christianity in America. They are very loud and very much swing their weight, but most of us are not them. Right. And, and if, the, if the election had happened differently in 2016, I think that that evangelical, that really strong, right, conservative evangelical that we're talking about, which is in actuality not evangelicalism, it's at this point is Trumpism, but that would have been a dying dinosaur and it still is, it just has power that it hasn't had in a long time. And that's what I also try to remind people that there is an alternative expression of Christianity and a faith in general that is not predatory and exclusionary and angry. And that's a difficult place for us to be in, you know, to try to keep, I say I'm fighting with and for my faith tradition simultaneously. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. Uh, it certainly, um, I compare this often to the, to the whole uh, premillennial dispensationalist thing that, you know, left behind was this huge book series and movie series. And most people think that's the predominant view in American Christianity, and it's not. It's yeah. still a minority view, but it's very, very loud. And it sticks. You know, there are things that, there are preconceptions that people get or there are stereotypes that people build. Some of it's because of their experience, and some of it's just because that's what they see on their Twitter feed. And that becomes reality of what is synonymous with a person of faith. And that's the dangerous spot we're in because I think so many progressive believers don't have representation. They don't have the Franklin Grahams. They don't have the Jerry Falwells to say, there is this beautiful expression uh, that, that is more empathetic 
and is loving diversity. And so they're not sure what to do. Wow, that's, yeah, that's just well said. We, we don't have those uh, on the prog progressive side of Christianity and the non-fundamentalist side of Christianity. Yeah. We don't have those big figures to, to rally around because it's sort of not our MO, right? And, and that's exactly it. You know, we, we don't want a centralized source of power and to have everything operate around a hub of a couple of people. And because we naturally resist that, that's going to always leave us at a disadvantage to presenting ourselves in, in, a, in a larger context. And that's what I try to do with the work every day. Yeah. So how often are you posting on the blog? Well, it really depends on what's happening in my life and what's happening in the world. But, you know, I write every day as a discipline. I get up every morning and I just put some words together. And sometimes they come out in books later. Sometimes I publish them on the blog, but I use that. It's the re part of the regular rhythm of my life. Um, I came through surgery recently, so that kind of really got me off my schedule of writing yeah. regularly. And now I'm trying to get back into that, that muscle memory of getting up every day and, and doing that. Yeah. Uh, before we get to talking about the book, uh, in, in particular, you just you gave me a prompt. I meant to say this up front. I th you've been very open on social media and in your writing about your brain tumor and the surgery and all of the indignities uh, that have gone with that. Yeah. And the, and the, since the good diagnosis generally and all. Uh, I, I meant to ask up front, how are you doing and um, wh what's the latest? Yeah, I should have said in the beginning, you know, anything that I say that doesn't make sense today, I'm going to bring, you know, you know, blame on that anesthesia yeah. fog or something. But, you know, six weeks, I'm six weeks out from brain tumor surgery, which has been obviously, you know, they went through my nasal cavity. So all the wounds are internal. And so everything is going well that I'm able to drive and exercise and, and live fairly normally. I have to take it easy right now, but um, doing well. And then we've got three weeks to wait and see if they got all the tumor and then what happens if they didn't, but uh, feel really fortunate that um, I've been able to, you know, feel normal. Yeah. So um, it may be too early to ask this question, but, you know, I, I know when, when you face a major medical issue uh, and one that's life threatening uh, or life changing, uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it causes you to sort of reflect on everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, any big epiphanies that you've come across lately or uh, any change? I'd like better health insurance, that's for sure. Uh, but, you, you know, I, I think I, doing the work that I do and the kind that you do, Mark, you're always trying to wrestle with some of the big questions of life and you're trying to put life into perspective. And, and so I try to do that as the regular part of my life. But what it did was it created a greater urgency to say, yeah, I know I'm going to die, but there was a moment in the hospital where I had a, a bleed out of and just thought, this is it. And you have that this is it moment and you think, oh, I just need more time. I just need more time. And then when you get that time, I've gotten, I've gotten that time now. So let me not waste it. So it's just about that urgency of the day that has changed a little bit for me, I think. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. And it's been great to follow your progress and to know that, you know, things have, have gone even better, I think, than maybe you anticipated at some points. So. Yeah, we had some, you know, complications in the hospital, but once we got through there and I said to my wife, you know, the book's doing really well, but if, if things don't go well for me in the hospital, it's going to skyrocket for you. <laughs> we, we just wait. I said, you can only get that bump one time, though. So I'm here and all, all is well. <laughs> yeah, the death bump. Okay. <laughs> A little morbid humor there. Uh, yeah, I mean, you have to, you know, there's no other option. Yeah. So uh, to talk about the book for a moment. Um, so this is what your, I think your fifth book. Yes. Fifth book. And um, yeah, it's been, it started with a bigger table, which was out of that viral experience was invited to write yeah. a book. And then this, this is largely, I think a continuation of that in some ways. Well, so my impression is that um, the books, um, the, the, the books tend to be a little softer in tone and um, broader in scope than, than the blog. Uh, I, I would even say maybe even more pastoral um, in, in a sense. Is, is that intentional or how do you distinguish yourself between the blog and the books? It often for me was about um, something that I wanted to say over a long haul. And I, I wanted to, I, I think, um, 
we, we, we released a collection of the blogs a couple of years ago, maybe a year and a half ago, because people were saying, you still haven't written a book that is the blog. And right. so to your point, I think there's a different um, intent when I'm, and when I'm writing in the blog sometimes, because I'm having to talk about the same issue, but maybe say it in 10 different ways. So right. sometimes I'm trying to reach someone uh, theologically with the scriptures that I know that they know. Sometimes I'm trying to tell them a story about a vulnerable person who I've encountered, who's told me a story. Sometimes I'm just trying to give them some tough love. And so I think there's a lot of different stuff on the blog tonally, but it is the incendiary, more pointed stuff that tends to reach out and be the predominantly read things, unfortunately, right. sometimes. Yeah, for so sure. So that's why, you know, if God is love, don't be a jerk. That was the my effort to say, okay, uh, I'm not going to sugarcoat this, but I also don't want you to leave. I want you to actually read it. I remember a bigger table, a lot of people said, you started the introduction with the day of Trump's, the night of Trump's election. And the moment I started hearing you talk about that, I stopped reading the book. And so that's the challenge too. It's you're trying to be who you are and still get an audience with people who think they know you. Yeah, well, so you, <clears throat> one of the things you talk about here that is, I, I, it just seems like a lot of us have been stunned during the COVID pandemic that a lot of Christians don't get the love your neighbor thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's there's data out there that has shown shockingly that huge percentages of American Christians don't see masking or being vaccinated or taking social distancing, any of that stuff. They don't see that as a way to love their neighbor. It's all about themselves and what they want. And you're, you're making a case here to sort of reclaim that whole love your neighbor thing from God is, is for real. Yeah. And, and that's the way, you know, the book started. I started writing the book. It was actually pitched as a slightly different book. It was a little more detached and sort of diagnosing this sort of Christianity that is toxic. And I started writing in March of 2020. And then as the pandemic started to unfold and I got into the summer, I'm wrestling with this book and realizing, okay, the world that I'm responding to usually in real time is not showing up here. I need to speak into this explicitly. And that was the reality that all the anti-mask energy and all the denying of the pandemic and all of the resistance to the Black Lives Matter movement, all of this stuff is coming from professed Christians, mostly who are white. And I said, okay, this is what I need to write. This is the book I need to speak into. And so the whole journey of the book has been about doing that, asking people to reconsider what it means to have love for your neighbor, for the stranger, for the least of these, and for your enemies. So that, that timeline is fascinating because that's a pretty quick turn in the book publishing world. Yeah, uh, I was fortunate because I, I've kind of said, um, you know, into this book, writing it, you know, how when you're, when you're writing, they leave you alone. No one, you know, you agree to write the book. Everyone says, this is the book you're going to write. Then you are in your little, uh, you know, cocoon for a while. And I really thought, well, this book is done. I can't write this book. And uh, my agent said, let's get with your editor. And, um, and we met, and we talked like we're talking right now. And they said, well, okay, you can't write that book. What book could you write? Uh -huh. And they gave me the permission to, to, to pivot right there. And that was just a really freeing thing. And that's why the book is a book that I love dearly of all the books I've written. It's the one I feel most uh, connected to because it was born out of a struggle to say, what, what do I need to be saying in this time? It's almost like a, a real-time journal of the pandemic filtered through the lens of my faith. Yeah, uh, and shout out here to Westminster John Knox Press, uh, the, yes. the publisher for being uh, adaptable and flexible uh, in, in this moment. Uh, as a published author, I'll tell you, that doesn't always happen. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. And that, that was almost shocking. It's like, okay, but now I have to write it, okay. <laughs> My, my next book I've just almost finished is not coming out till 2023. So, <laughs> and that, yeah, and that's the other part of it that for me, the writing of the book has always been such a challenge <laughs> because the book is this long arc of a thought over time. And by the time you've written it, you're, you're a completely different person than when you started. And that's oh, one yeah. of the challenges is how do you have a thread that is, feels authentic when you're done. And so uh, the, the rapidity of this, the velocity of the writing was helpful in that way. Yeah, so what you've really got is almost a, a, a book that's been published in real time. Uh, yeah. Which is much more akin to what the blog could be, right? 
That's right. And it was much more born out of, it wasn't just responding to uh, random things in the abstract, but it was saying, okay, this is what's happening today. So you'll, as you read the book, you see that I'm talking about people I saw in the grocery store who are fighting over toilet paper and you see people in parking lots and you have conversations and it informed what I was doing in such a different way than something I tried to digest six months later. Yeah. So what's the response been so far? What are you hearing from, from people as they read the book? We have been, I mean, I, I've been completely overwhelmed. The book came out three days before my surgery. So I was telling people I have a book and a brain tumor coming out in the same week. And I said to my followers and, and social media contacts, I can't go out and promote this book because I'm going to be in the hospital and I need you to do that. And so people have been wonderful about sharing it. And it's just, I can't tell you how gratifying it is to have been recuperating and seeing the book take off in this way. And most people, if there's a common thread to all the, the responses, it's been this piece of the book is something that I've had in here for so long, trying to figure out how to express it. And you've helped me express it. And now I can have either a conversation with someone or I can simply rest and I can have this exhale of seeing that I'm known. And uh, that's nothing greater as a pastor that you can have is letting someone feel some sort of healing connected to something that you've put out there. Yeah. Let me pause here and say, as we move through this, <clears throat> if, if you have questions you want to ask, uh, please start using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and type in uh, questions. This was a great, this is a great pivot to a question that just got put in uh, by my friend, Eric. Uh, who said, my pants don't fit anymore either. Uh, I definitely don't fit into the evangelical pants that have bowed to fundamentalism and now Trumpism, but I don't fit into the relaxed fit deconstructing pants either. <laughs> Great line. Uh, I still believe Jesus is Lord and the only way to true reconciliation with God. I believe we are created to love him and love others. I believe the Bible contains God's inspired word. I believe we are to share the gospel in love in ways with everyone as God's good news, I don't believe we should bow to the altar of mindless diversity any more than we should bow at the altar of white Christian nationalism. Where do I fit in? Mm. I bet you've heard that question before. Yeah, I have. And, and Eric, what I would say to you is what I say to many. One of the first things that people who are, who are not where you are, who are in a real strong defense posture about their former faith, they'll, they'll point out the inconsistencies they see in my perspective or what I've written or what I've said. And I'll say to them, yeah, I see those inconsistencies too. That's the whole problem I'm having. And for someone like you, where do you fit in? I think we forget how decidedly uh, individual this spiritual journey is. We try to make, put us all in a community and say, let's all agree on these things or these things, but we know that doesn't exist. And so I would never struggle with where you fit in. It's not, um, it's not this mindless diversity and it's not Trumpism. And there's, that's, there's more than that, right? There's this, this expansive space between those and you're simply there. So you're gonna line up with me on some things and some things you're not. And the beauty of it is, that's all good. I mean, God is fine with that. I think that we have our intellect and we have our discernment and um, you have your journey. And so I would just not feel like you have to fit in anywhere. You simply are. You, the, your faith is hard one. You know your personal story. You know how you got there, why you believe what you believe. And it's about you simply sharing that. That's all I've ever done. I've never said to someone, I'm an authority on this. I have simply said, this is the gospel according to me. This is what I've seen. This is what I've experienced of the love of God. This is what I've seen in community. This is my understanding and engagement with the Bible. And you can have yours, and that's fine. Well, that's really helpful. So, I mean, it seems like most people just think, we, we, we've been taught that, that we got to pull some faith off the shelf that in a pre-made can yeah. that's either with this label or that label. Um, but people are much more complex than that in their experiences and their own beliefs, right? Yeah, and I tell the story in the book about being sort of having these 3D glasses on at a, at a 3D movie and then realizing I had the wrong lenses on and talked about this really individualized God that we have a, we have a personalized um, doppelganger God that tends to resemble us in some way. And so we all filter the words of scripture. We all filter our 
pastors and we are in our churches and our life life experience and so we come up with this really uh individual sense of god even though we would say that we don't and i just want to lean into that i want to try to figure out like what did i bring of myself to this idea of the divine what am i carrying from my childhood and what still needs to be jettisoned and i think there's a tremendous freedom there or there should be if we're talking about the maker of all things we should be able to have a rest in that. Yeah, so I, it, as I hear you talk, I'm wondering, uh, it's fascinating that you started as a youth pastor. Uh, and I'm just wondering how much that experience in dealing with youth uh, has shaped your ability to be who you are today. <laughs> Oh, gosh, I think it, probably I felt like the, the youth ministry is the no BS zone of the church in that teenagers are, will be relentless and they'll, they'll laugh at you or they'll call you out on things that seem ridiculous or they'll point out inconsistencies in what they think that you're saying and you have to respond in a real way. I think when I, when I see pastors I and mean, I've served sort of as a lead pastor, I, I, was, um, I had a buffer between myself and the people I was preaching to because I was preaching to them, but I didn't have them in my face all the time. Whereas if you're in a lock-in and you say something, well, that's it. You're going to have to be accountable. And so I think that gave me a sense of, I don't want to sugarcoat this. I don't want to try to talk around it. I just want to say it and then we'll deal with it from there. So that the bluntness or the openness, I think is a part of youth ministry, um, residual youth ministry stuff. Yeah. And on the other hand, as a minister at large, without a specific congregation, uh, you can say things more freely, uh, and there, now it, yeah. there's not that same level of immediate accountability, right, uh, to yeah. things that's both freeing, but, but perhaps too much sometimes. I don't know. What do you think? I think the danger in doing what I do, I have to get up every day when I'm writing and say, do I really believe what I'm about to say? And I need to check my motives as to why I'm saying it. So I think we talk about the acerbic qualities of some of the things that I that I write. And I look at Matthew chapter 23 and I see Jesus railing into the religious leaders. So I know that there can be something redemptive about that directness. But for me, as I talk about in the book, I think Jesus' heart was always, was not to damage religious leaders. It was to show them the damage that they were doing to people that he had deep empathy for. So I try to keep, make sure that I'm making sure that I'm fueled by that empathy. And then I'm saying what I'm saying wisely, knowing that those words are ultimately going to be received in a thousand different ways based on a thousand different people who hear them. Yeah. And so I have to be okay with that. Yeah, boy, that's that that that's absolutely true. I, you know, I, I wonder at root, um, despite your journey, I mean, some some of us on this journey that you've been on would have left the church. Mm -hmm. Some of us would have some of us would have said, "I'm done, checked out, done something else." What has kept you in? I, th I think uh, sometimes I think it's a, it's a muscle memory that I have this this thing ingrained in me of uh, the fear of God being angry at me. You know, a lot of things keep you kind of in there, but it's mostly been the deep sense of belonging and love that I have received. And it's things that I've had a front row seat to that I cannot I would not have seen any other way. And so I remind people all the time. I'm still here because this has been my journey and my journey has been the words of Jesus and the Christian church. And because of that, I'm never going to jettison that story because it's, it's made me who I am. So I have to give that story credit all the time. And I have to, I can't throw that story out for the toxic parts of it and the damaging parts of it. Um, so it's just a tension I'm thinking I'm going to have for the rest of my life. Mm. Well, that's not a bad thing. There, there are worse things. And I think that's been, you know, when I wrote the blog that went viral, as I said, you know, I, I started saying, well, my church is going to be really angry. Well, what I found was there were some people who were, there were a lot of people who were relieved. And there were some people who were saying, oh, thank you, because I, I've been waiting for someone to say that. Right. But what it reminded me was that there, that tension should exist. We, we should always say, why do I believe what I believe? And a lot of times the book just simply says, hey, we've said this our whole lives. What does this really mean? What does God's plan really look like? What does God's will really mean if I can choose? 
Um, what does it mean when I think that God thinks that I'm filthy? Um, how do I, how do I deal with that? Do I really believe that God thinks that? So yeah. that's what I do. So we have a question from, um, from Earl who wants to know how should a Christian respond when responding to Paul's letter to the Colossians regarding the do's and don'ts of the Christian life and his second letter to Timothy, uh, uh, Earl's an adult Sunday school teacher for many, many years, by the way, you can see this coming through here, very well versed in scripture. Uh, his second letter to Timothy regarding the human characteristics that a person has that essentially demands that Christians avoid persons with such characteristics. Part of this question has been adjusted this week since it seems that a major evangelical preacher, John Hagee, uh, has hosted a bunch of conspiracy theorists and avowed Trumpists that seems to express within a church environment blatant falsehoods. <laughs> I apologize for an inadequate attempt to express this well, but I think we get the, the gist of this. How, how do we reconcile this teaching of the early church uh, with the world we live in today? Well, sometimes, Earl, I think what's happened is we, when we read the scriptures, we have now an inverted world that we should be filtering these things through. So in my case, I'm looking at what Paul talks about in pastoral leaders. Um, and I, I realize that the people who I see as pastoral leaders were precisely the people that now um, I'm supposed to, Jesus would say to be careful of them. And so and the, it's the people outside of the church that seem to have the values of Christ more often. And so I find that there's a moral inversion that happens. And basically, I just take this person to person and church to church. So I look at someone like John Hagee and say, wow, that's a really concerning expression of a collective body of believers. But I have to remember that that does not re represent all bodies of believers. And so I have to just simply treat everyone with a uniqueness um but it's hard to take those words that we've read so often and then we make them into a blanket statement over the world that we live in and i try not to do that i try to say i've got to deal with this person or this church or this experience or this political party in front of me very good uh so diane asked a question she, she says your assertion about lack of central leadership is a major issue. Those of us who don't fit the pants anymore, not even with the gibby waist gray sweatpants, she says, uh, seem to be centralizing around voices like yours. We whisper to each other our dissension in the side conversations. How do we best find a consistent way of broadening thinking outside of the pulpit or our one-on-one -on -one advocacy? Diane, I think, a couple of things. I, I hope that more people who have um, disconnects with their pastors, if they are still connected to a local church, a local faith community, that they find ways to not only express those, um, those disconnects, but to give their ministers permission to be fully authentic. Because a lot of times they are simply, you know, I started this, no pastor starts wanting to be uh, dualistic or du duplistic. They, they just say, I have this group of people here. I love them. I want to serve them. And then they slowly become beholden to them. And so we want people to make sure that they let their pastors know that they are free to be a fully formed human being with thoughts and, and feelings and to express those. But I think then it's about you saying, I'm also outside of this building, and maybe that's the place I'm going to do the greatest work. Maybe I'm going to connect to people in my community, and I'm going to begin doing the things that I wish the church were doing, or saying the things I wish the church was saying, because there is an alternative to a one hour on Sunday, and I think we're seeing that now, especially with the pandemic. Uh, I have, I reach hundreds of thousands of people and they're, most of them aren't counted on Sunday in a church, mm. but they're expressing the empathy and the justice and the mercy behind the ministry of Jesus. So I would say to push back where you can in your local community and then realize you're going to, you're going to be outside your community much more than you're going to be inside it. And that's where you're going to do some great work. So John, I'm really struck by a line you just said there that you reach hundreds of thousands of people and most of them are not counted in attendance in a church on, on most Sundays. Uh, that, that is a powerful platform um, that I think just taps right into this 
thing that we're struggling to understand about people who are on the margins of the church, mm -hmm. uh, the, the people who've sort of mm, excused themselves but haven't completely given up on church, who want to, who believe, who want to believe, but aren't there on Sunday morning. And this is such a common, big trend. How, what would you explain to us about such people who, who, who you're writing to? I think the biggest misconception is that they're a monolith and they're not there for reason A or reason A and B, when in reality, many of them are outside of the church defiantly, many of them are outside of the church reluctantly, and many are outside of the church and they're grieving that fact. So some of them wish they could be there but can't, and some of them have been pushed to the periphery. And so if people who are within those, those buildings or in those faith communities need to understand the, the diversity of the people who have been on the exodus um, and try to figure out, we may not be able to reach this group of them, but these other ones who are struggling in these areas, maybe that's where we are gonna put our energies. Um, there's a, a tremendous feeling of homelessness out there. People saying, boy, I miss that muscle memory or that, that mm -hmm. um, rhythm of my life of being in a community and I'm not there and I'm grieving it. So for me, that's what the, the blog is like this strange hub where people say, you know, I tell people all the time, my, my readership goes up on Sundays tremendously because people who are outside still have that, that rhythm in their lives and say, this is the spiritual day. Um, really interesting. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that, that, that's a fascinating data point that your readership goes up on Sundays. Mm -hmm. And, and it would, I wouldn't have expected it. And so almost when I'm putting out the, because I recycle old posts that are evergreen and then I write new stuff and I rotate it every day because I know new people are coming every day. And so Sunday is a day where I'll put a lot of posts where I say, if you were in that space of really saying I'm disconnected from community, spiritual community, and I want it, what are some things I'm going to put out there so that you'll read it and maybe that'll be the doorway for you? Yeah. By, by the way, I, I think it's important to clarify for everyone that uh, you're a one man shop, right? You, you, you don't have a, a back office of people doing uh, all these uh, administrative tasks for you, right? <laughs> I mean, I, I am fortunate to be married to a graphic designer and a, a, a tech savvy person. And so my wife, Jen and I, we, we do everything. We're a mom and pop organization. I mean, we, I write all the blog posts and I create all the artwork and the memes and, and we do, you know, an Etsy shop, but it's really just about, this is our ministry. And back when we started, it was the two of us with 15 teenagers in a room and we did all that stuff. And it's just then kind of how it's gone. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that you seem to have done that eludes most uh, aspiring writers in the Christian market is you, you have found a way to make this a, a living, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I know you, you mentioned the Etsy shop that y'all started to help supplement uh, income and, and so forth. Um, you probably get the same kind of questions that I get from time to time from young writers, aspiring writers mm -hmm. who want to know how to, how to do this. And uh, what advice do you give to young writers who are wanting to break into the market? That's really a difficult question because I, I, I had no intention of doing this. So I've often had to go backwards and say, yeah. okay, well, what happened here? Well, I was a graphic designer that helped because I made stuff look nice. And when stuff looks nice, people are going to read it. And I had some marketing background. So I was always a copy editor. And so that really helps as well. But for people who want to make writing their life's work, I just remind them, that their authenticity is the only thing they have that is unique. Everything else you can find an app for, you can find third party vendors, but you have a specific story that no one else has. And so for me, writing the blog post, if I have gay children was not, oh, this is where I'm gonna begin my massive social media empire. It was, this is the deepest contents of my heart. And then everything else was following along and making sure I'm still doing that. Because then I realized, I'm going to find the audience that connects with me. I don't want to write something that's disingenuous and connect to people on a falsehood because that's going to be a trap. So it's just keep speaking what you've seen and what you know and what you believe as best you can. Yeah, I, I, that's really beautiful advice uh, because it seems to me that most, most people who gain a platform, it's not because they set out to necessarily, right? Yeah. It, 
they had something worth hearing that that caught on yeah. along the way. Well, and the other bit of you know the perspective that I gained was when I was a mega church pastor and I had these. 2000 people who I felt beholden to and I was sort of trapped in this thing and couldn't be fully authentic. I got out of it. But the other trap is you become beholden to the audience that you've developed or the community that you've reached. So I have to make sure that I don't write just to make sure no one who's progressive is going to get angry at me. And so that's the other part about it. It's getting up every day and saying, I don't serve any of those things. You know, what do I really believe I need to say into in this moment and let let the reaction be what it's going to be. Wow, well, yeah, that, that's a great goal, isn't it? And uh, we all we all struggle with that, uh, to be sure. So there are five or six or seven or maybe ten hot button issues that your content circles around that are just the issues of the day, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, we, we could we could make a list of those. I'm wondering, in your experience, which of those are you finding people to be most interested in? What lights things up most frequently? I think most people are really either in tune or they're really, um, they really have a, a, a trigger about around white supremacy and racism, especially in the church. I think for some people, so many people have begun to see, yes, we have not talked about this enough. While others, that is the place where they dig in their heels and they feel themselves kind of resisting the conversation. And I think so much of the fractures in the church and the toxicity of organized religion stem here in America from that supremacy. And so it touches a lot of different issues. It touches economic issues and it touches issues of, of free speech and of opportunity and education. So I think that's the space where most of this is revolving right now. And also because frankly, we have a political party who, who seems to have um, be legislating things that are undergirding white supremacy still. Yeah, uh, you live in North Carolina, I live in Texas and we both experience that on a daily basis. Yeah. Uh, with our state legislatures, uh, to be sure. So a segment of uh, your work is on LGBTQ inclusion. Mm. Um, and I wonder if you just talk about how that fits into the bigger scheme and what kind of pushback uh, you, you get on that and how, how maybe that's relevant to any of the rest of this. I, well, that was where the doorway issue for me, that was the place where I said as a pastor, I'm not sure this is ringing, ringing true for me anymore, this, what I've taught or what I've been told I should teach. And I, I always say life began to argue with my theology, and that was where the tension in me as a minister came. And so I started digging into those handful of verses, and then I thought that was all I was going to do was kind of excavate this issue. And then what, of course, I found was, well, it touched every you know, book of the 66 in the Bible, it touched all the different writing. It wasn't just these isolated things that I now had to question. So for me, it was a gateway to asking questions. And the pushback was difficult at the time because I was still an employed pastor. Everything since then, my wife, I remember the first day she said, well, they can't fire you again. And that's kind of where I've been. So the LGBTQ stuff, it gets as much resistance as anything that I'll write. And it it doesn't bother me in the least because I understand where it comes from. On, on a different but related note, um, you know, uh, one of the challenges that we deal with in, in this work is that uh, we are both uh, white males of a certain age uh, and certain privilege uh, to be sure. Yes. And it is, I mean, it's just the it's it's who it's who we are, where we come from. Can't change that, right? And, and yet, I know that I want to empower other voices uh, to be heard. I want to amplify other voices to be heard. But I've also been given a platform and an opportunity uh, to say the things that need to be said. How do you reckon with you know that that amount of privilege that you carry? And um, I'll shut up. Just. That's, that's the idea. No, I, you know, it's a great question. And it's something that originally when I got some notoriety for speaking on the LGBTQ issue, you know, rightly had tons of people say, hey, I'm an LGBTQ activist or just a minister or a human being who's been saying these things for years. And you come along and say them and they somehow go viral. 
And that showed me the delicate balance between realizing that I still had an audience with a certain group of people simply because of my physicality, while also not monopolizing the space. I was talking to uh, Reverend Carlton Pearson the other night and um, Bishop Flunder and uh, Dr. Vanessa Brown on Beyond the Gatekeepers. And they said to me, John, what we value is actually that you are speaking to a group of white people who will listen in a way that they will not listen to us. And so we appreciate that much of what you're writing is not just to everybody, but it's very specific to people who look like you and have the story that you've had. And so I do both of those things in tandem. I try to respect the platform, not monopolize the space, but also realize that has given me access to the people that I really need to reach. Yeah, uh, that, that, that's a very helpful insight uh, to be sure. Well, as we, as we approach uh, the end of the hour, let me just say to everyone who's out there, if you have another question, pop it in real quick and we'll get to it. But as we get to that, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, as we start to, to wind down, John, what are any big ideas or points that, we've, that I've not asked about that you think would be important in this moment to be heard? I think what I want people to remember and think about today, Mark, is that, as I mentioned, grief and fear are at the core of why we believe what we believe, the, the theology that we have, the the legislation we support, the politicians we, we vote alongside. And so we look at the grief and the fear, and I always ask people to look at the person across from them and say, where is the fear and the false story? And yeah. if I can give people a better story, not to change their mind, but to take away their fear, they might respond differently. And I think what we're seeing in the theology of the day that we're talking about is, is all based in fear of the other, in the prejudices that we've yeah. grown up in. And if we can release people from those, maybe they're going to see things differently. And the same for me. I have to look at what drives me, what the story I tell myself is. And that's what I want. Less fear and less grieving. And I think will be greater at empathy. Well, that's, you know, that's great advice with Thanksgiving coming up and people being around, gathered around tables uh, yes. that are not necessarily bigger tables, to borrow your phrase, yes. uh, but very conflicted tables, right? <laughs> Yeah, and there, you know, really quickly, you know, we don't want to avoid speaking directly. We want to stand on our convictions and not soften them. But we want to remember that on the other side of them are people who have reached their conclusions in as complex a way as we have ours. And so to keep remembering there are human beings, there are stories across from us. Wow. Well, uh, John, let me just say thank you for your time. Thank you for the beautiful insights. It's great to be able to have this public conversation Absolutely. with you. Uh, we're, we're big fans of what you're doing and uh, thrilled that you're doing well medically thank as you. well and uh, wish you a, a blessed Thanksgiving coming up. Thanks so much. Thank Goodbye, you, everyone. And thanks to all those who've watched today. Really appreciate it. Be well. All right. Bye-bye. Support independent faith-based journalism. Baptist News Global.